Welcome back to English Audiobooks. Listen, read, and learn. As we step into the new year, join us for more captivating stories and enriching experiences. Ready for your next literary adventure? Let's dive in. The Yes Men of Venus by Ron Goulart. Introductory Note Let me begin by expressing my thanks to the executors of the Arthur Wright Bemis estate for choosing me to complete his unfinished stories, of which this is to be the first. Like so many others, I have long been an admirer of the books of the venerable fantasist. Nothing has ever given me the thrill that reading his first novel, Russo of the Jungle, in installments of varying length in the old Thursby's All-Star Electrical Fiction Weekly did. Unless it was reading the 23 sequels, especially Russo's Revenge and Russo, Friend of Animals. This present story belongs with Beamy's Planet Adventure Yarns. It was in the winter months of 1929 that Arthur Wright Bemis penned the first of his many scientific fiction novels. In an era when space travel was little known or speculated on, Bemis had his likable two-fisted hero, Hyacinth Robinson, travel between planets with ease. Hyacinth Robinson, as you may remember, had been standing too near a reservoir in upstate New York, and when the water evaporated he went with it eventually drifting to Venus where most of Vandals of Venus takes place. This story was an instant hit and was soon followed by Vagrants of Venus, Mermen of Mars, Misfits of the Moon, Plundered on Pluto, and many more. Now that many of Beamy's books are freely available, it was felt by his estate that his unfinished work should also be given to the public. So here is the new Beamy's we have all been waiting for. Chapter 1. A Minor Cataclysm my heart was heavy as I drifted over the remote reaches of the Pacific Ocean and the atomic-powered Zeppelin the World League of Peaceful Governments had thoughtfully allowed me to borrow in order to show their gratitude for my having ended the Fourth World War. Several weeks ahead of time with my lucky discovery of a powerful ray that made gunpowder ineffectual. This balloon cruise, as pleasant as it was, had been planned as more than just a dedicated scientific attempt to map the migratory routes of the Arctic curlew. It was to have been, too, my wedding journey. As I followed, with my binoculars, the happily paired curlews flapping to warmer climes, I tried to think of some reason for the unpleasant turn events had taken. When I had called for my beloved Joanna on the prior morning, her father, the noted munitions tycoon, John Plunderbun Brimstone, had left not his best wishes for a safe honeymoon, but, rather, orders for myself and my zeppelin to be thrown unceremoniously from the grounds. All my leaden heart could be sure of was that I would never again walk hand in hand with the handsomest, most athletic and yet feminine, girl in the state of New Jersey. The thought of what I was doing would have brought tears to my eyes had I not been as masculine and manly as I am. For the curlew was the one bird that my Joanna and I had always thought of as our bird. But the rapid deflation of my zeppelin vanquished all self-pity from my mind. I was galvanized into action. Placing my binoculars back in their case, I dived without further thought from the gondola of the falling zeppelin and into the placid waters of the Pacific Ocean. Perhaps some well-placed parting shot from one of the minions of Joanna's father had done its slow work and been the cause of the untimely cessation of my means of transportation. I am an excellent swimmer, and so there was no dread on my part of the long swim ahead. However, I had barely covered a mile when I became aware that something was tugging rather forebodingly at my ankle. My impression was that I had caught my foot in the compelling maw of some great clam. Before I could reflect more, the creature had pulled at me so forcefully that my head, the hair of which I wore in a somewhat long though manly fashion, was yanked below the breath-stopping waters of the ocean in which I had so recently found myself. I fought bravely, being an excellent boxer. An old ring axiom has it that a good big man can beat a good little man. However, most rules of honest boxing were not made with giant clams in mind. For one thing, I could not be sure if I was fouling the creature or not. As I struggled, I became more and more lightheaded and giddy. As I drove an excellent jab home to what I hoped was a vital spot of the clam, I suddenly lost consciousness. Chapter 2. The Mysterious Host I came to in a clean white bed with a large, handsome man looking down at me. He was a striking fellow. To give you some idea, I will simply say that this man, whose name I soon learned was Lowell Hawthorne, 
was even better developed and more manfully handsome than myself. You've had a bit of a close shave, old man, he said, gripping my shoulder in a perfectly manly way. American, aren't you? Right you are, old man, he said. Mabu, my native boy in number, his native boy, fished you out of the briny. Scared the simple fellows a bit at first. They're not used to finding chaps such as yourself inside giant clams. I had some talking to do to convince them you weren't a large pearl or some such thing. I believe it is oysters rather than clams that are best known for their pearls, I said, good-naturedly, for I took to this handsome, though mysterious, American almost at once. Who can tell a native anything, was his honest reply. I suppose I am to be laid up here for a time, I said. A few days, said Hawthorne, drawing a bamboo chair near to my side. If you don't object, I'd like to tell you a few of my adventures. For, if I do say so myself, my life has been both curious and strange. By all means, I encouraged, being anxious to learn more of this enigmatic man who apparently lived contentedly here among savages and giant clams. I can tell by your look, he began, that you are a man of science and that you may at first be a bit skeptical. Let me begin by saying that for the past five years I have been in close radio contact with a man living inside the planet Venus. Inside? I asked. Come, Hawthorne. Science is well aware that people live on the outside of that damp jungless planet. But inside? Put aside all your scientific learning for a moment. My new friend replied. If you do you may learn something. At least you will have whiled away your convalescence. So he began the odd and compelling narrative that you will read in the next chapter. Chapter 3. Down and Out on Mars I am the reincarnation, began Hawthorne, of an Egyptian priest, whose name if I were to mention it you would recognize as being as familiar to you as your own. Having lived several lives I reached this one with more than the usual sense of ennui. I tried many things, shopkeeping, the cavalry, gold prospecting, writing for the magazines. None of these helped, nor could love. For in ancient Egypt, I had loved a handsome and sporting priestess named Isis. After her, all other women were anticlimactic. As fate would have it, she whom I sincerely and respectfully loved never seemed to get reincarnated during the same era as myself. You know how women are about keeping appointments. One evening toward the end of 1970, I was strolling through Central Park long after the hour when most men thought it safe. To a man such as myself, a man who fought the Red Indians without a qualm, the worst terrors of Central Park after dark held no dread. Still, I was taken aback when seven youths fell upon me with baseball bats. You have perhaps found, as I did that night, that even a superb physical being is no match for seven men with little respect for the correct way of life, in large clubs. Though I maimed and injured a good number of them, I was nevertheless knocked unconscious. When I awoke and took a step, I bounced twelve feet into the air. Some reappraisal of my surroundings seemed in order. Central Park had surely changed considerably. It was now a great red desert. I took another step and bounced again. Then the awesome truth came home to me. I was no longer in Central Park. I was on Mars. I am aware that you scientifically inclined chaps talk of space travel as being a remote possibility. You will realize, of course, that in 1970 no such thing was even at the experimental stage. Therefore I knew I had been transported to the red planet by some mystical means there is no way to explain. I was still engrossed in seeing how high I could bounce when three large green men rode toward me mounted on gigantic hairy horses that boasted two extra sets of legs. The green men themselves were twenty feet high and turned out to have, now that I noticed, an extra set of green arms. This is not the sort of sight someone who has only recently been battered with wooden clubs wishes to see on awakening. But appearances are not always the best indication of the man, and I soon found my green welcomers to be quite decent. By means of a method too complex to burden you with, we soon taught each other our respective languages. The green men were named Jarlzun, Zinjurg, and Yekserb. I explained to them that I had apparently transmigrated to Mars by some strange means. You picked a bad time to transmigrate, said Jarl Zun, shaking his great green head. Why is that? 
the three of them proceeded to explain to me as we shared a breakfast of keks, which is rather like our cold oatmeal, that Mars was in the midst of a Great Depression. It seems that the head of their government, the Dactor, who was roughly equivalent to two of our presidents, had been wooed into the camp of the more radical element in the Martian society and instead of listening to his yak Dactros, or well-wishers as we would call them, and building up comforting supplies of Zug beams, or what we would call death rays, he had foolishly poured the taxpayers' money into Europe, which is something like our social security. The result was rampant radicalism and poverty with little or no respect for Gumba, roughly equal to our patriotism. The upshot of this enlightening political indoctrination was that I would have a tough time making my way on Mars at the moment. Zinyurg and the rest helpfully offered to bat me over the head with zubs, roughly equivalent to our baseball bats, in the hope that I might then transmigrate back to Earth. I, though, having been an optimist in nine out of ten of my previous reincarnations, decided to brazen it out. Stick I would in all, be it I was down and out at the moment I felt I would not be for long. Such was indeed the case, as I will next relate. Chapter 4. The Great Games of Maroom I threw in my lot with the green men who were, it evolved, en route to Maroom, the capital of this country, to enroll in the Great Games. It is difficult for me to find a parallel on our own planet for these Great Games. What transpired at them, as I was to learn only too well and shortly, was this. The bloodthirsty citizens of Maroom flocked to a large stadium and there witnessed various fellows fighting one another and also great and ferocious beasts, of which there are many on this depression-torn planet. Should a poor mendicant triumph in one of these gruesome contests, he is awarded a cash prize. This explains why the down and out of Mars flocked to Maroom. To Maroom then my new friends and I made our way. For although on Mars I was now called your sud, or shorty, I still vowed that I would beat any man or beast I came up against in fair combat, especially if there was money involved. We had hardly reached the suburbs of the great and decadent capital when I heard a girl screaming in a tone that indicated her very honor was at stake. Borrowing a sword from Yek Zerb, I jumped from my riding position just to the rear of his saddle and ran toward the scene of the struggle. My green acquaintances had informed me that the green men were not the only race on Mars. There was also a pink-skinned human type much like myself, only taller. Still, I was not prepared as I dived into the murky, sword-choked alley between two crumbling ruins to see before me a girl of striking beauty of figure being pummeled by a large pink man in a leather suit. One kiss is all I request, the man pleaded in a slimy voice that was far from manly. One will lead to another, the girl responded in a tone I admired. Soon you will require other favors. One little kiss. By Zarg, their idea of God. If you don't kiss me quickly, Dina Taurus, I will have you locked away where kissing is out of the question. Lock if you will, said the brave girl. For kiss you I never shall. I waited to hear no more. Stand, sir. I cried. The young lady does not wish to be kissed. The man was nearly eight feet high though it was evident that his pursuit of physical gratification left little room for a careful program of physical fitness. Beat it, your sud, he bellowed. Do you dare to interfere with the Yaks Tarkas on his appointed rounds? I don't know what a Yaks Tarkas is, I replied, but I know that my blade will cut you down if you don't depart this woman's side at once. His only reply was an angry grunt. He then came at me with sword drawn. In my student days in Paris, I had astounded my teachers with my ability as a foils man. Fortunately, on Mars they fence in the Parisian manner, and I was soon able to run the pleasure-bent Yaks Tarkas through, and then dispose of his body in a pit beneath the ruins. When I returned to the heavy-breathing girl, I suddenly gasped. Isis. I cried. For she, indeed, it was. My name is Dina Taurus, she replied. I do thank you for aiding me. For your kind act, though, I fear you will incur the wrath of all Maroon. My own Isis, I continued, whom I have not seen for nearly two dozen reincarnations. Don't you remember me? Have you forgotten Egypt, my love? You speak, sir, of love, the girl said in a tender voice. I was about to bring up the topic myself. I feel somehow that even though you are shorter than most, you are a man I could someday marry and kiss freely. 
I fear I have never met you before. Look, look, I said, beginning to draw a map of the solar system in the dust of the alley with the tip of my recently injured sword. Look there. I proceeded to explain where the planet Earth was in relation to Mars and then where Egypt had been. I told of our great love on that spot. No wonder I haven't been able to find you again, I concluded. You've been reincarnating here on another planet. Be that as it may, Isis, we are together again. As you talk and as I look at your handsome face, it comes upon me more strongly that I am fond of you. Isis, however, I am not. Dina Taurus, a simple shop girl, is who I am. As Dina Taurus, I sincerely hope you will find your way clear to love me. She was my own Isis, and yet she had no recollection of it. I determined to court her under whatever name she was using. Once you have loved a woman such as Isis, it is hard to shake the habit. Dina Taurus you shall be, I smiled. Dina Taurus, I love you, and ask your leave to pay court to you. My leave you have had since the moment you leaped into this fetid alley, she replied tenderly. Tell me, by the way, what is your name? My name is Lowell Hawthorne. From behind us a grim voice spoke, Lowell Hawthorne, we take you prisoner in the name of the city and county of Maroon. A dozen heavily armed men had approached us quietly while we had talked of love. What is the charge? Killing a yak's tarkas and throwing him in a pit. Come along with us. To my new found Dina Taurus I whispered, just what is a yak's tarkas, my love? The talent agent for the great games, she gasped as the lawmen carted me away. That is how I came to be sentenced to fight in the arena of Maroon. Chapter 5 In the Dungeons My cellmate in the dark stone room under the arena was a handsome tan man named Joel Lars. We soon became fast friends, not merely because we were padlocked together, but because we shared a great community of interests and also believed in the manly virtues and a planned program of daily exercise. We will not be called into the arena for many days, Joel Lars told me. Unfortunate, I said, for I have only now re-met a girl for whom I have searched many centuries on many worlds. Too bad, he replied with real sympathy. Speaking of girls, would you care to hear my story? It would help pass the dark hours here. It took place on Venus, which as you may know, is a planet in the system of ours. I am a great admirer of that planet, I said, pleased to continue. Of the overall surface of that planet I know little, when on Joel Lars. Of its interior I know only too much. For it is there that the only woman I will ever love, Verl Yank, is at this moment a captive of the fiendish yes men of Venus. How does she happen to be inside Venus? I asked. Let me go back a bit, said Joel Lars. My parents were missionaries and one fine day they took their spaceship to Venus. Our crewmen proved disloyal and in a dispute over shorter hours they threw my beloved parents and myself over the side. We were stranded in the steamy jungles and my parents soon succumbed to the moist living. I, a mere boy of seven, survived and was raised to manhood by the Boogdabs, what the Martians would call Yarsniks, roughly equivalent to the Earth's great apes. What of the cursed yes men and your dear Verl Yank? Being raised by great apes has a strange effect on one answered Joel Lars. It took several years of therapy to completely rid me of the idea that I might be an ape myself. I still dream sometimes that my mother was. Now, as to the yes men, his narrative was cut short at this point by the arrival of a group of guards who flung our cell open and pulled us to our feet. There has been a last-minute cancellation, one of them, a coarse hairy fellow, explained. The star gladiator is ill, and you too will have to go on in his place. Closing note, what transpired next would fill a book itself. And this is exactly what my agent has advised me to do with it. The End <laughs>